Good morning. Well, we continue to look at this prophet of Isaiah as he looks forward. He looks forward to what God is going to do, the way he's going to bless his people, the way he's going to be with his people. And as I was trying to say yesterday, he wants to bless not just the Jews, but he wants to bless the Gentiles as well. You know, when we studied some time ago the letter to the Romans, we find there that Paul was writing to the Christian church in Rome. And the Christian church in Rome was going through a strange time because the Roman Caesar, because he was angry with the people, had exiled all Jews from Rome. And as a result, of course, the, the Gentiles had taken over the church because the Jewish people had gone. But then later on, because he needed them, he allows them to come back again. And the Jewish Christians come back into the church in Rome, only to find now it has been led by Gentiles. And there was an animosity between the two groups between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says, you know, you're one people, Jew and Gentile, you're one people. You must learn how to live together. You must learn how to get on together. You must learn how to worship together, because you are one people. The Gentiles have not replaced the Jews. Neither is it a Jewish church with just Gentiles tagged on. It is one church, Jew and Gentile, and Jew and Gentile I will bless and Jew and Gentile as one church, one church, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. These are the people I'm going to bless, this new church which is going to come into being because of the death of Jesus on the cross and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But now if we come to chapter 44, and we just see these same words almost being repeated again. But now Israel... Sorry... But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurim, whom I have chosen. For I'll pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour up my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Yes, God is going to bless us. That is his purpose. That is what is, what is going to be happening. This is all that we're seeing, all the things that are happening. It is just a matter of preparation. It's just a matter of training. You know, I, I used to love going through, through school and you get towards the end of the year and suddenly it all began to make sense. You could see exactly what the teacher had been talking about throughout the year. It all made sense. Then he went home for the summer holidays and you came back in September and what happened? You had new problems. You had to see it in a different way once again. You had to experience something different. Oh, wish we could go back to last year and learn those lessons. It's almost the school is saying, well, you did. You learned those lessons. Now you've got a new set of lessons to actually learn. And I think that is what God has been doing with his people throughout time, through his Jewish people and through the church. He is saying to them, learn your lessons. Leave it behind. Learn what I've shown you. Now leave me there, move on again, and find out what I'm asking of you in the future. And he says here quite simply, he is truly going to pour out upon both Jew and Gentile his Holy Spirit. He's going to give them these blessings. But then he goes on to say, be careful, because you'll always be tempted. Be tempted to go the way of the world. You know, figuratively, Isaiah uses this almost like this term of Egypt, that you'll go to Egypt to see how Egypt is working it. But of course, what Isaiah is also worried about, it isn't that we'll go to the world to learn from the world the way they're doing it and try and do it their way. But he says here, as was happening in this particular way, they would go out and they would see how other people are worshipping God and try and do it their way as well. In other words, they would try to create idols like the nations around them had idols. And God is almost making fun of them, he says. You take a piece of wood, you cut it in half. Half of it you burn on the fire in order to get heat. The other half you make into a god and you bow down to it. Don't you realize this is completely useless? This is of no effect at all? Learn from me, he says. I am a living God. I am a living God. Come to me and I will show you what it is you have to do. You know, just as an aside, just as an aside, we get the word of God given to us, the great logos of God, the word of God. Jesus says, John says of Jesus, in the beginning was the logos, the word of God. 
the word that spoke everything into creation. And the whole of scriptures from beginning to end is a revelation of God to us. It's a revelation of God to each one of us. What we must do is come to that revelation of God that God has given us and say to him quite simply, show us from your word what it is that you want to us. Let the logos of God become a rima word, a particular word in our lives at the moment. What do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do tomorrow? How should I live my life today? How should I govern my family tomorrow? How, what, what type of work should I do? Where should I live? Ask God to show you because God longs to show you what he wants of you in your life. And here he's saying again, don't turn to the world. Don't turn to the world and ask opinions in the world. Come to me. I will show you. I am a living God. And I will show you how much I can do it. Because as I go on now in the chapters that lie ahead, you'll begin to see that I really do know the future. And therefore I can help you in whatever way you need. Amen.